Welcome everyone to See Through Panel, the podcast about graphic novels, comics, uh, basically comics in any form. This week we're going to be talking about a book called Monstrous, published by Image Comics, written by Marjorie Liu, art by Sana Takeda. My name is Cole Harvey. I'm here with Fahed Araman. Hello, everyone. Fahed, why don't you take it away with the uh, the intro here? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, as you mentioned, this is a uh, ongoing uh, comic book series uh, that premiered in 2015. Um, the series is set in a matriarchal world inspired by early 20th century Asia. It tells the story of uh, Micah Harfulf, a teenage girl that shares a myster- mysterious psychic link with a powerful monster. The background to the story is a war between the Arcanics, magical creatures who sometimes can pass for human beings, and the Kumea, an order of uh, sorceress nuns who consume Arcanics to uh, fuel their power. Uh, Micah is an arcanic that looks human and who's set on learning more and and avenging the death of a mother of her. And um, yeah, that's kind of what the the kind of the the general um, gist of the kind of background to the story is. All right, that's not that's actually to be honest, that's like <laughs> you could just read that instead of the first two issues. I never read the actual intro. Yeah. So um yeah I I I quite enjoyed this um I think the first thing to say is that the artwork is absolutely stunningly gorgeous I mean it's just that first class stuff um just straight off the bat it's a beautiful thing to look at It is stupid how good the art is in this book it is absolutely unfair yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, it is kind of like you see the standard that um, you know, sh- you know, um, uh, San has reached in terms of um, the character design. Well, I've got issues with the character design, but just the, the level of detail, the um, panel layout, the um, the emotions that the uh, the faces of the characters um, convey, just everything about it is just top, top, top level. It is, it's like you said, it's just stupid and it's almost unfair to kind of like other professionals uh, in, in the field that she's able to produce uh, stuff of this high, high, um, high standard. Yeah, when I first went in, um, I figured I immediately, you can immediately tell from the first page that it's going to be crazy. Um, so I was worried that she was like a great, um, like background and concept artist, but I wondered about her, like, uh, facial expressions you know and portraying like the character acting but that also was spot on so that was i mean if you can fault anything in this book i doubt it's gonna be the art because i can't really imagine anyone being like yeah this is just it's not for me it just seems too too well done yeah i mean i've got um i've got a couple of issues with the art um one of them is that I think occasionally with the character designs, um, a lot of them are too pretty, if you know what I mean. It's kind of the same um, issue we ran into with Mem- Memento Mori Sins, where kind of like all the characters are kind of like really pretty. Kind of, you know, you get that kind of like Final Fantasy, um, Japanese yeah. RPG feel, where kind of like everyone is just a little bit too gorgeous it's a little bit too hollywood if you know what i mean i definitely agree yeah uh i don't know if that's i don't know if that's sana takeda the artist or marjorie Liu too because uh sana takeda like you can tell she can draw um you know non-perfect people because a lot of the people in the background are like the the people who aren't main characters basically are they're not that all that like good looking so they definitely can draw that but yeah, basically all the main characters are like peak human. They're yeah. essentially like perfect people. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a lot of... It's surprising I've not seen a lot of this. Like, it's, it's not something I look around a lot for in, in any case, but this is kind of like top, top, top rate fuel for like cosplayers, I'd imagine. I mean, there's some really gorgeous outfits in this. And, and yeah, you, you're right, kind of, especially I'm thinking about the guards in the... Um, the first issue a lot of those 
guards are they you know they are ugly but you know the main characters on the whole are kind of like yeah as you mentioned peak human beings yeah basically that's i would agree with that before we get off to or two off the rails um let's do how you felt about at least the beginning of the story or like the way it opened because for me this was um slow to start i think just because the way that the story is built it's very based on world building so when we first started i was like uh, a little bit i took a step back because the scope is really large and then you have a lot of uh, factions at play and then like groups within those factions different characters so how did you did you get lost at any point within this first yes. 18 issues yeah i got um uh, there, how, how to explain there was a lot of info dumps but like the info dump wasn't particularly clear and kind of you know there's a lot of um different factions at play and you know um i, I was confused uh um i'm still confused about kind of all the different um loyalties and factions that are involved in the it kind of in the world and it can be this isn't a book that can necessarily hold your hand. It's a little bit like um, uh, Winds of Winter, Winds of Winter, um, Song of Fire and Ice, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, yeah. where it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to you know, mention all these names and it's up to you to kind of like keep up with it. So, um, yeah, I, I do agree with that. I, I was, um, I did go back a, bit, uh, a few times trying to figure out who was loyal to who and all that sort of stuff, yeah. I didn't have a, t- a ton of problem with it. It was like a slight learning curve, but I think the fact that uh, just kind of uh, n- n- not unrelated, I've been re- like getting into fantasy books lately. So when I read this, like I've been just binging fantasy novels and when I like prose novels and when I uh, read this, it felt exactly the same. You could tell it was kind of a novel, like a, like a, a fantasy novel esque way to start a story with the amount of world building they do. Cause a lot of comics don't do that. Cause yeah. they're not, a, they're not going to plan for such a long thing, but clearly Marjorie Lou pl- is planning for a long series. Cause I think even through the 18th issue, we're still like introducing groups of characters and the, the world is always getting bigger is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with that. And there's, yeah, there's kind of always a sense that, um, so what, what I read, I, I did a bit of reading. I think you did a bit of reading around kind of, um, especially the, the first uh, trade paperback. And I think the first issue for this comic was like ridiculously long. I think it was something like 70 pages. Yeah, the it first was. Issue. It was 70 pages. Yeah, so which is, I don't know what you think about that, but that's for a first issue, that's that's really long. That I mean, that's almost like a, a trade paperback in itself. Yeah, that's, it's, I don't know if Marjorie Lou was prepared for it either because that's a completely different um, structure than a normal single issue. Yeah. Uh, and so the pace, the pacing was a bit um, start and stop for, on the first issue for me. Uh, there'd be really, really compelling parts and we kind of hit a wall for, I don't know, 10 pages for me at least. And, um, you know, once I got past it, I was so scared when I read all those pages and then I flipped a page and it said issue two. And I was like, oh, my God, if that's one issue and they're all like this, I'm not going to read it in time. <laughs> but, it was just, yeah. but yeah. I mean, it is dense, but it definitely speeds up as you go along, I think. I think the first the first volume took me the longest to read, and then they got faster from there, just either because I was more into it or because she's got less setting stuff up to do, you know? Yes, I, I would probably... Well, I've, 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 I've read this before, so I did get through the first uh trade paperback quite quickly and i think the advantage of me kind of reading it again it kind of there was small um details that i didn't notice the first time through that um that i noticed uh on this reading that kind of enriched the experience uh quite a bit so yeah kind of just little things that they did with um yeah, one of the things I wanted to mention actually was the uh, lettering by uh, Russ Wooten, which I think I, I'm not sure if I've, I've, I've seen anyone else do his style of speech bubbles where they're kind of like connected by these uh, lightning strikes between kind yeah. of like, yeah, I, I know I really, it's, it just, it 
really lends itself to um, uh, kind of the, the fantasy world that it's set in rather than kind of, you know, your, your, your bog standard um, speech bubbles that you, you might uh, see in, um, in a, in a different comment. I just, I, I really, I appreciated that because um, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to let my own comics at the moment. And it is a lot bloody harder than it looks. So like, you know, hats off. Oh yeah. Hats off to him. Yeah. It's easy for lettering to look cheap if it's not done very professionally. And this guy, Russ Wooten, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Russ Wooten. He's, um, he's done a couple image books and I think some DC and Marvel books. So he's a, he's a pro and he, every, like everyone will do the multicolored speech bubbles to show you who's talking. But yeah. the way that these are set up in this book, it never, it never didn't work. Like I always knew who was talking and who was whatever color, even if the colors didn't really, like, I wouldn't think blue for this character and just know it, but it worked because you could tell whose dialogue is who. So I think the lettering, uh, went well with the writing there and the, the two gods um, in the middle and towards the later of the book or the first 18 issues, uh, they have really cool speech bubbles. Too. Oh, yes. Like yes they do. Yeah. Yeah, they do. The yeah. red and the green. Yeah, I really liked that, too. So, I mean, the lettering did lend itself. You actually notice the lettering, which normally would be a bad thing. But I thought it was pretty uh, noticeable in a good way for a change. Yes, I yeah, I, I completely uh, agree with that. I, it just made me. I, I I just kind of like noticed it and it's it's really admirable, kind of like in 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 the uh, correct sense of that word. I, I really admired what he was doing with the the, the lettering there. So just the entire visual package, um, everything from the line work to the inking to the pencils to the lettering to the coloring, it, it just it, it's it's not surprising that the um, that it won so many Eisner awards. Yeah, not really. Not surprising at all. <laughs> yeah. Just from looking at it. Did you find the story to be um, compelling? Like, did this, this is the main character, Micah, uh, Micah Half-Wolf, I believe. Is she, I mean, is she like a compelling main character to you? Um. So this is what I would uh, say about Micah. Um, she reminded me of, have you seen The Legend of Korra? At all. I've not. Okay, I've so not. I, I stopped I think, after Avatar. Yeah, so I think you know uh, Avatar: Legend of Aang and Avatar: Legend of Korra. I think ten, fifteen years down the line, I think you know cultural um, assessors, you know cultural commentators will kind of look at back back at those two series and say, you know, these two TV shows have had a massive cultural impact on. Um, comic books and uh children's tv and novels and everything else and i think a lot of a lot of the reason why um people don't see you know don't hold uh the legend of core in the same high esteem or as closely to the hearts as um uh legend of ang is because ang is a really lovable likable character and cora is at times a bit of a dick and he's not very um likable and she makes really bad decisions and i think that's kind of i think a lot of that is the same for micah as well i think the legend of cora finished i think a year before this was published so i think for me there's a clear through line in terms of the influence that cora as a character's had on micah because kind of micah's not it's not particularly likable character she makes a lot of bad decisions and it's kind of self-destructive in that sense as well so y- compelling yes sort of but she's not someone that i'd be able to kind of like hold dear hold, hold, hold close to my heart if that makes sense no i think you're probably right um she Definitely has likable traits, but then she just the way she goes about um, trying to accomplish what she wants to accomplish is a bit um, reckless, I guess. And yes. at times to me, uh, narratively, it feels like all these characters are kind of like being pulled on a string, like everyone, their motivations are there and their reasons to do it are there. So it's weird that I don't feel like it's organic, but some of them just feel like they're I think it might be the dialogue. Um, some of them just feel like 
they're so sure of what they will do next. They're going to do this no matter what. And you don't really need a reason to like know why they're about to do that or how they're going to do it. Um, it's also kind of part of the world building thing. Cause sometimes you just don't know how things are happening until a bit later or like how people kn- know the things that they know. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting take on it. Um, yeah, I suppose. That, yeah. That, that there are sometimes where you think, well, why is she making that decision or why is this character making that decision? Um, yeah. And yeah, there are, there are, you know, a couple of points we think, well, maybe she's doing that because the story requires them to, to do that rather than it being kind of uh, a decision that, that, that character in that moment in that world would naturally take. Exactly. That's a much more eloquent way of saying it. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And I think the, 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 um, the other thing about, and I was reading a few interviews about this and, um, kind of I was just wondering if like Michael was a boy whether it'd be a bit more easier for me to kind of relate to some of the decisions that he's uh that she was um making because you know uh, I think Lou especially kind of talks about um you know and this is not something I'd realized until Lou I, I read an interview of Lou that most of the major players in in the story are women and I was like, oh yeah I didn't realize that and then I was just thinking maybe right. my this I won't say dislike my kind of inability to kind of bring my my, my career into my heart is kind of maybe that's because she's a woman and if she's a boy it might be a bit easier for me to kind of like relate to her on that level I don't know what you think about that I mean she's kind of just hard for me to relate to in general just because she she has like her couple her couple of hooks as a character are the the intrigue of the monster in her um uh, you know her past. She was like a child during a time of war, so she's kind of broken in that way. And then she physically is; she has no uh, left arm, I believe. Yeah, her left yeah. arm is gone. Uh, so there's like, and then, but emotionally, I don't know if you have a bunch of hooks because um, she's just like a big old dick all the time. Yeah, and she's very violent. Which I mean, the monster makes her violent. Sometimes that violence is done; it's compelling in some ways. It makes you feel for her because she doesn't want to be doing it. But other times she does just want to be killing people a lot. So, and I don't always have a ton of like things. I don't always want her to win, to be honest, but I am very compelled by the story. And I think the story is kind of the biggest character in the book. Yeah. I, it's interesting you say that. I think I connect more with the monster that's inside of her. Than, than I do with her on the same oh, level. I'm, yeah. Do, do you you know, know when they started introducing his backstory, I was yeah. like, this is my guy. This yeah. is the story I want to know about. Yeah. And this is a guy that goes around kind of like eating people and kind of like, she, you know, slowly devouring like Micah's body and not a nice character at all. And yeah, I connected emotionally more with, um, oh, what's the name of the creature? Yeah. They didn't give the name, name to the creature. Isn't it like Zin or something with a Z? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I connected more emotionally with that character than I did with um, uh, Micah, who's, I think, you know, she, not only is she like a, a child of war, but she's also, it sounds like, it's not clear, but it sounds like there's, um, she was kind of abused by her mother as well. So there's also yeah. kind of that sort of thing, but maybe then, you know, kind of the mother went back and kind of apologized. To be, so it's not clear whether those um, memories or accurate or not, but yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I hadn't thought about them being kind of not trustworthy memories because they do the memory. The, I think there's a, there's almost every issue has kind of like an underlying memory going on. At least they use it, at least every other issue. Oh, yes, um, they do. They do, yeah. They yeah. use it quite often just to like always be revealing new things. One of the things I had a problem with is every time we get a twist, which this is a problem for me that I find in a lot of media, it's not just just general in stories. When we get a twist, uh, then it's pretty dramatic for us and for Micah. And then every other character is like, oh, yeah, I did know about that also. And then everyone has that information. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And that's just that's a problem in a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like she has an aunt, and then everyone's like, "Oh yeah, your aunt." I'm yeah, 
And I'm just like, wow, this is there's a lot going on here that everyone knew about but wasn't talking about. Yeah, it's kind of that um like a sign of bad storytelling is where the audience is not in on the secrets that um the character's not in on, if that makes sense. So kind of like yeah. it makes sense for Mike and not to, to know about all of this stuff, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for the characters around her to, to actually know about it and withhold it from her. It's kind of, yeah, it's not particularly clear why these characters are hiding all this information from, from Micah all the time. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not something I'd actually thought about before. They, they can't, I'm coming off harsh here. Cause all I say is negative stuff, but I actually really like the book, but um, I think the way she, she does cover it. Well, she covers that. I wouldn't call it a flaw, but she covers, covers that aspect pretty well because she's also always revealing like higher authority characters and every time she introduces a higher authority character you're like oh they know a lot more stuff than we know so it makes sense that they know this big twist Um, yes so i think that does it does cover it up sometimes instead of like just the people next to her like oh yeah that so there's just new a new character comes in and knows but yes um, the, the authority figures got me because um like half the characters in this are like super uh, badass authority figures and they're always just demanding stuff like half the dialogue is demands i don't know if you had a problem with this or not it wasn't really a problem but after like the 10th or 11th issue i was like man people are always just like shouting down to people to get stuff for them and like everyone has everyone is in a position of authority yes i think you know kind of going back to kind of a uh, game of thrones that's one of the things that george R. R. martin does well is that there's kind of like subtle cajoling and blackmailing and stroking people's uh, stroking people's egos and kind of like you know subtle emotional um levers and pulleys to try and uh, maneuver the person into doing what you want and in here it's it is kind of like well you're going to do this because of this and you're doing that because I'm I'm the big boss and you haven't got really exactly. any any power Around it. I think that they were towards the, I think, I can't remember if it's the second or third trade paperback where they introduced the prime minister of the human world. And she's trying to kind of like subtly rest power away from the Kumea. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's subtly, but, you know, certainly when it comes to kind of Micah, she's you know, do this, do that, go off, do your own thing, whatever. Yeah. Which is so sad because, uh, Kippa, the Fox, I actually, I think it's a little boy, but is it a little girl? I couldn't, really... I think it's a girl. I oh, think crap. it's a girl. I, yeah. I didn't even start questioning adorable. it. Yeah. She's just adorable. Just so the cute. Most adorable, cutest thing. Just holding, but her, you know, the, the scenes where she's kind of like talking and holding onto a big fluffy tail. Just, Oh, that's just, yeah, so cute. <laughs> I know. Yeah. She gives her own tail a hug when she needs a hug. It's so cute. Yeah. Uh, I also thought the cat thing, while it could have been kind of annoying, it was awesome. Like the cats are kind of awesome. Yes. Uh, I thought that could be overdone, but they have like their own society with the poets and the necomancers. that speak yes. to the dead. So uh, that's that was cool. Very kind of like, um, Final Fantasy, very um, Robin Hobb kind of heavily, oh, yeah. heavily, heavily influenced kind of thing. A kind of you could kind of see that um, there was kind of a lot of you know JRPG um, uh, influences, kind of like the the cat characters, basically like Moogles from Final Fantasy world. The one thing I wanted to uh, talk about um, a little bit: Did you find like, I don't know if it's just because we were in lockdown, but did you? I, I, I struggled to to read through this at points because it's almost relentlessly grim. There was kind of it just kind very of, grim. it's it's very, it's very very kind of it's all war and violence and people being horrible to each other and kind of the only moments of levity levity are with um, the fox character and. The cat character is there's a little bit later on when we get introduced to um Micah's uh goddess father, the the big tiger bloke, 
but yeah, apart from that, it's almost relentlessly grim. Yeah, it's a bit of it's kind of grim, dark fantasy. Uh, I think that all, largely has to do with the dialogue. The dialogue is is just very edgy at times. I think it, it kind of does a disservice to the book because it it's got all these things that make it very adult feeling. Um, like it's it's I guess it's not fully portraying nudity, but it's like kind of casually doing that. And it's kind of just like breaking down these barriers that we have with fantasy comics. But then it falls, it almost feels like YA, like young adult stuff, because the the, the dialogue will veer into the, a little too edgy for me, a little too grimdark. And then um, just some of the way the characters act. Yeah, they just only want violence. And um, there's, I'm trying to think of one character that's entirely, it hasn't done anything really bad. Because even the, even her goddess father has uh killed people he says he's killed a bunch of people yeah he's a pirate so, you know so yeah yeah and he's kind of like one of the most nice guys in the book so i yeah. don't know i can't think of anyone that's not um kind of a piece of crap yeah it's um yeah yeah it's kind of that that ya thing is it's uh, it's quite an interesting thing that you you've kind of picked up on there because there is kind of uh, you know, Micah's love story with the winged arcanic. Um, we've I've got to do a better job of remembering, uh, of actually writing down the characters' names. Um, she's the the character that goes off to. She's like one one of the highborn people. Oh, the Tuya, 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 Tuya. Um, and she's going to be getting engaged to to Micah's auntie. Is that correct? I think so. I so yeah, that was um, that felt to me like very YA teenage um, love triangle sort of thing. Yeah, going on there. Yeah, like a bit of a, a YA conflict. Yeah, especially because I thought we had a lot of more problems like than a love triangle, um, but. I mean, I'm not really bothered by any of that. I did think um, that was well done. The like the Micah Tuya um, love interest thing was well done because I literally had the thought before the reveal. I was like, she really talks to her friend really closely and seems to really love yeah. her. And then I was like, okay, it kind of yeah. makes sense. As soon as they reveal, you're like, I I kind of saw that coming. Yeah, but in the good way. In a good way, I think um, it was pretty well done. That's kind of another reason why I say there's kind of the, the influence from the, the legend of Korra because Korra I can think kind of like famously is the first bisexual character in a children's television show and kind of like having um, Micah be um, a, a lesbian in this for me is kind of like a natural follow on from that. And if you look at kind of like um, Korra's design and Micah, they're kind of a little bit similar, I think, and oh, especially yeah. kind of like, the you know, the world of the legend of of Korra is, I think, you know, I think they I think someone described it as um silk punk, and I think that's kind of similar to the world of of um monstrous as well. The world, I think, I think we've only kind of uh, preferred touching it. The world is like uh, amazing. The, the, the actual world, the story is setting is absolutely fantastic. I think. I love it's probably my favorite part of the book is the setting like I love seeing the different cities I honestly uh there's an info dump at the end of almost almost every issue has either a big text box info dump um with a little bit of Sonic Takeda art or like a propaganda poster yes um, I think they stopped they, there was a couple issues that didn't have, have them towards the end but uh I actually never was mad at that because it's just like a big lore dump where they're giving you the history of the world and like a bunch of events and places and then when you see them in the book it's really gratifying because you just read like almost an entire like prose book page about it and and it's like steampunk at t it's got airships and guns yeah. and I, like there was a grenade at one point and i was like i physically looked up from the book and i was like there's a grenade and it was it was confusing but i did really enjoy it yes uh yeah it's 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 the, the the amount of effort that um like the imagination of like Marjorie and um Santa to, to to build this you know really engaging uh world is is you know it's it's remarkable it's it's really 
you know, as someone who writes my uh, you know, writes myself, it's you know when you when you're collaborating with a, with a comic book artist to kind of like tease out these these details, and it is the, the details of the of the world that I think makes the the difference here. Um, it's not easy, man. It's really, 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 really difficult. It's really hard, and um, they make it look easy. Oh yeah, Marjorie. Marjorie's super lucky she got Sana Takeda because Sana Takeda is like working so well within this world. She has like the people, just the people in the background, let alone the, the main characters, like clothing changes in the city. Like you could tell that there's different cultures depending where we're, where we're at. Yeah. The landscapes are completely different. She always does it. When you're entering a new big place, she'll give you a huge establishing shot, which is always just amazing to look at. So yeah, Sana T- Marjorie Liu, of course, made this world and she's, been she's been constantly adding stuff to it and like getting digging you deeper with every issue giving you more and more which is a really good unrelenting but then sana takeda like brings it to life insanely well yeah it's yeah. it must have been like a dream for marjorie lou when she had she she had like this amazingly detailed world and then sana takeda's like at that same level that must have been just fate, yeah honestly yeah um Oh, the one thing I wanted to ask you about were how, how did you feel about the magic system and kind of like the power levels of the, the various characters? Because it's never, it, for me, like the monster that lives inside um, Mike, it's never particularly clear exactly how powerful he is or if it depends on how often he's eaten because sometimes he's you know able to wipe out an entire, it seems like an entire army of, of people, but then will struggle against like a robot or something. So, or a, uh, one of the witch nuns. So for me, yeah. I was a bit confused about oh, what's the, what's the power level of this guy? What the, what are the systems involved and that sort of thing. Yeah. He does change it a bit. Uh, he, I guess. Yeah. So the two times he like explodes largely, um, she loses a piece of her arm, which I'm fine with that. Cause that means you can't, do it too often um and there's a cost to it and i like that but then other times you're right because the one thing i do remember there was a time you're introduced to the monster it's towards the early maybe issue four or five and the monster they meet the guy with the wings the raven raven born um, oh yes and the yeah. Mo- yeah the monster says watch out i i probably would it'd be a hard fight for me to even take him and i was like wow so he must be insane because this monster is like a dead god yes. and then the like uh mother this the, the supreme witch nun kumea uh yeah. lady with the mask uh she comes and he's like yeah i can't even take her and i was like so there's so i the power level will just keeps ch- going up and up and up and like there's more and more powerful characters just like more and more authority figures and so i got a little lost on where on how mike is still like killing everyone yes because yeah because he just said he wouldn't be able to handle her and then he kind of just does <laughs> Yeah. Just explodes there. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it feels like we're, we're just talking about the negative things about the book, but it's, it's a really enjoyable, it's a, it is a really genuinely very enjoyable read. You know, the, the world that um, the story setting is, it's fantastic. Mike is maybe not the, the most likable protagonist, but there are lots of stories with unlikable protagonists. I'm, really keen to see how the stories end um i I read a an interview where the i think volume five is going to be released this year um at some point and they say that's going to be the halfway point of the story so we've got another five volumes so that's what's that going to be at least what another three four years worth of stories do you think yeah well it's taken them five years to get this out. I think they took a long break, and then there was also yeah. quarantine when they started yeah. back up. So, oh, also that volume five comes out September twentieth. I actually read that earlier. Thank you okay. for reminding me. And yeah, that's I think up to issue thirty or thirty-two. So yeah, probably thirty-ish more issues after that. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think it's. Um, I think it is. I mean, this is that. This is Premier League stuff in terms of the you know the storytelling the world building um and you know the things yeah. we're kind of like picking up around here 
are just because the, the rest of it is is so strong i think oh 100 percent. is so many nice things have been said about this book it's won so many awards i'm not gonna stand here and tell you it's bad it's actually it's amazing but i mean if we didn't talk about if we just said how good it was the whole time it wouldn't really be a podcast would it yeah 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 gotta talk about something yeah, I think that's kind of. I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to talk about. Is there anything left on in, in your notes that you wanted to kind of uh, mention? I think I hit all the notes I wanted to. Um, I mean, I would say if just like as a general end note, you read this. It's really, really, really good. It's like um, for the. It doesn't. It's image, so it's not like indie or anything. But uh, you're not going to really you don't find stuff on this scale anywhere, really, especially for uh, such an isolated thing like it's clearly an entirely different medium almost than DC and Marvel books. So this is pretty non indie stuff. If you're getting into like non superhero books, I think it's way worth it. It does. It requires a bit more of your time and a bit more brain power. But uh, it is it's not the densest thing. And it's very, very. uh, beautiful to look at so i think it's it's 100 percent worth checking out yeah i would i'd i'd ag- agree with that I'd, I'd say if people are burnt out on superhero comics and if you're especially if you're a fan of um fantasy books you know a fan of george rr R. martin or um ursula gwen or robin hobb and you've not picked up a comic book before i think this is a really great, uh, you know, great series to start off with, to, to jump into kind of fantasy graphic novels. Um, also, if, you know, if they're fans of Legend of Korra or Legend of Avatar um, that are kind of like looking for the next fantasy world with a strong female protagonist, um, which is full of like high adventure and, um emotional emotional kind of ups and downs this is uh this is you know another series i'd recommend for those people as well it also yeah works well for cora and avatar too because it's kind of got that eastern mythology in the world yes. too yeah it's kind of really fun. yeah sorry you was gonna say oh no no go i was just saying it was really fun we always get the you know the european fantasy yes um i mean kind of just like a complete side point to this, but um, I, you know, I play a few video games and I just kind of, you get kind of sick and tired of every time you see a video game, like the protagonist is a white guy with brown hair and kind of blue eyes. So it is nice to see a world where there are kind of a diverse set of characters kind of, um, you know, in, in monstrous, it's kind of set in a, a world inspired by, um, 20th century Asia and as you mentioned it's not like a homogenized Asia kind of like all the different cities and different people have kind of got their own individual feel which I think is really nice and it's also I mean until I read it in the interview I didn't realize most of the female character most of the lead characters were, were female um as well so yeah it's um it's got a lot lot going for it I I definitely agree I'm gonna keep reading it honestly I hadn't uh, ever read it before this i'm just going to keep up in issues i think now digitally okay uh, you bought the um that, the volume one which is kind of the first free trade paperbacks in one uh in one book didn't you yeah it's called monstrous book one versus it's instead of volume one so it's a big hardcover okay now, is there a kind of um you know what's kind of like the is is it a, is it a nice thing to hold? Because I I I got the trade paperbacks from the library and they're kind of battered and some of the text is a bit faded from there and that sort of thing. So oh, I was just man. wondering, kind of like, you know, what, what the actual book, the physical book, yeah. was like. Uh, it's a really nicely made book. Uh, I own a lot of hardcovers and stuff, and I bought this one just because I saw Sonic Cicada's art. Um, it's not like hugely oversized it's definitely bigger than a trade um yeah it's a bit bigger than a trade it's the if you've seen any other image hardcover it's the same size oh, okay um, sure uh yeah and um it, it, it the art looks really nice because originally i had read um two issues digitally and i was like i'm just gonna have to look at this because i i enjoy my art 
just physically i I just enjoy it much more every time i look at it in person so i decided to get this i think i'd say it's definitely worth it yeah this is kind of a discussion for offline but you know i'm i'm getting a bit fed up with digital comics at the moment but yeah that's a discussion for 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 another time (laughs) yeah I 100% get that. Sometimes they're just they're just different. They're yeah, they're just different. They're, they're, they're different. Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely good. But uh, if that's all we have, then I think we're about good. That's that's uh, that's good for me. All right. If you guys enjoyed this, please check us out. We are on YouTube, of course. You know, we are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Pinecast. If you want to support this podcast, you like listening to it. Head over to tips.pinecast.com slash jar slash see through panel. I'm going to put that in the YouTube description. That's see through panel with dashes between. That's just the easy donate. You don't have to do it. We just really appreciate if you do. Even a buck helps. So, uh, helps us, you know, keep putting the show out on time, motivates us to do it better. So, we're going to try and get on a pretty, uh, tight schedule here for head. We're going to do this. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank- we're asking for money now, so we have to. <laughs> <laughs> we're not asking for it. We're just thanking people who offer it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a nice way. There you go. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks, guys. Bye.